The Industrial Revolution is over. We're entering the information age. No one knows for sure what the world will be like in the year 2020, but the experts all agree on one thing. Computers will be at the heart of every aspect of our lives. Over 100 million people worldwide now have access to the internet, a global network of computers that's growing daily. It's a communications revolution. There's people, you, the way you can email people, there's the, you can live talk to them, you can see them while you're talking, you can send them files. There's business on the internet. You give somebody your web address and they'll come to you. What could be simpler than that? And in the future, it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. There's no sign of it ending. Um, and you basically, you can't ignore it any longer. What will make the internet so powerful is convergence. In the future, TV, radio and newspapers will all be available on demand from anywhere in the world. Hundreds of newspapers are now available online. The Newcastle Journal was first printed in 1739. Over 250 years later, the online edition can be read by anyone with access to the internet. There are no printing or delivery costs and the news is updated continuously. There was a, a reservation uh, among some of us that actually putting so much content online every day might actually damage the sale of the newspaper. Uh, but in fact the reverse has, has occurred. The sales of the newspaper are increasing and the web audience. Uh, and at this early stage it appears that we're finding two different audiences with it. Um, and of course, uh, being online, uh, a lot of our audience comes from abroad and from outside the area. So we're reaching new people and that's got to be good for us. Already it's possible to see TV news from around the world on the internet. At the moment the pictures and sound can be a bit basic, but it's improving rapidly. Viewers can watch live broadcasts or see a recording without the need for a video. You can even pick the news items you want to see, creating your own bulletin. It's a hint of things to come. Spencer Hudson is a mathematician and futurologist at Teesside University. Change is nothing new to any of us. We deal with change and adapting to elements within the environment every day of our lives. And our ancestors previously have also had the same types of problems to face. The thing that's different about nowadays and what's changing now is not necessarily that, but it's just the speed at which change is occurring. We've seen advances in my own lifetime from technology advancing every couple of years through now to advances being made every s several months. Every couple of months there'll be something new coming out that we have to adapt to. Digital TV is going to be coming along quite shortly and I think that's got big implications for all the media. Uh, all the different kinds of strands of communication are starting to converge and so newspapers are starting to look at uh, sound and vision uh, TV is starting to look at, uh, at text services uh, and when digital radio comes along uh, it'll be technically possible to send pictures down radio waves. So everything's going to be much more blurred than it is at present. This blurring of media boundaries is already underway. Now anybody with a home computer and camera can broadcast pictures of themselves around the world. <laughs> Football clubs in the region have been among the first businesses to see the potential of broadcasting to their fans directly. Major soccer clubs like Newcastle United have already begun setting up their own TV stations. In the near future, clubs will be able to feed out match coverage and club news directly via the internet, with fans paying a fee to watch. With the advent of the internet and the way in which it can distribute information and technology in general, we can find that democracy can be improved because essentially we could have a vote every day on any issue if we so desired. Now whether or not we would obviously want to do that is another matter. If virtual reality can be harnessed to virtual touch, virtual sex with a computer may be possible. 
If the experience is entirely artificial, pornography laws may be powerless to control it. But commerce on the internet is not restricted to adult material. Most of Britain's large retailers now have websites. Some supermarkets allow online customers to order their weekly groceries and have them home delivered. A van can carry the shopping of up to 30 families, saving on car journeys and pollution. The fashion industry has been at the forefront of online shopping. Internet presentation and marketing is now taught at the University of Northumbria. It's seen as an essential skill for the new crop of trendsetters. Online shopping will be second nature to people. So what we have to remember is that all our measurements will be held on computer so we can go home. If we decide we want a new suit, all we have to do is through virtual reality technologies, whether it be something like a touch screen or a virtual reality glove, we can choose the fabrics. Um, also, there'll be something like an online colour consultancy. So we just have to say we've got blue eyes, brown hair, we're a Leo, we've got a good personality, um, we're fun-loving, etc. And that the garment we want is maybe for autumn, winter, you know, 2022. And the online colour consultancy will be able to give us um, some sort of idea of the colours that we should be choosing. Information age materials are expected to bring a revolution to clothes design in the next 20 years. Self-mending, intelligent fabrics are predicted with shape, texture and colour controlled by embedded microchips. One of the most interesting developments has been microencapsulation, whereby chemicals or um, vitamins, perfumes can be trapped inside of the fabrics. Fabrics are going to smell nice um, for medicinal purposes, they're going to benefit the wearer. Also, there'll be self mending where the iron will be very helpful because the iron would then bond together the fibres and mend it. Maybe in the future, we may be using microchips, which will be found in garments and in footwear. So almost making the telephone obsolete because you could then store and transfer information from one, one to another. The young designers graduating from the region's universities this year will be reaching the height of their careers by the year 2020. They're in a better position than most to guess what the trends will be. This generation that's moving up now wants to experiment a lot more a lot more colour and be very individual. I think that's what, what is going to happen in the future. The way I see it going is that things are getting less and less and less and it's just becoming like minimal everything just seems to be so simple um, that I think that the fussiness and loads and loads and loads of, of attention is is long gone and I think it's small details or just simple and comfortable and then when we've chosen our garments all we have to do is then choose our fashion accessories which may be the watch that um, takes our pulse and checks on our health status and it could be our jewellery that communicates with other people, it tells us what time the next film's on. So it's all going to be, it's very new and different at the moment. People do see it as very sort of sci-fi. Coming up in part two, what will our homes look like in 2020? And will we take holidays in space? Forecasting the future is big business. Graham Leach is a professional futures analyst with the Henley Centre in London. He's just produced a major report on the year 2020 for Barclays Life. Futurology has acquired a poor reputation over many years. And we think that's partly justified because in many areas of technology forecasting, the failings have been really, really quite significant and, and, and very bad. Also, in the realm of economic forecasting, failing to spot recessions, failing to spot recoveries, failing to, to really understand the dynamics of the housing market in the early 1990s has led to people again being cautious and, and, and poo-pooing the idea of looking at the future. But that really is only part justified um, because after all, all entrepreneurs are futurologists in some sense. They're looking at the future and saying, I've seen an opportunity, I've seen something somebody else hasn't seen. So people naturally look at the future and people are naturally futurologists. People look at their own family situation, their own work situation, and they're saying, what might the future hold for me?
there's been no shortage of visions of the future on film. In the 1936 classic, Things to Come, Alexander Corder tried to imagine what Britain might look like in 2036, less than 40 years from now. He predicted we would all be living in underground cities powered by artificial sunlight. Rubbish, graffiti and unemployment had no place in the new utopia, which was conceived before the realities of pollution and the energy crisis began to bite. We are now more than ever aware of the need to conserve energy and the environment. The reality is that by the year 2020, houses will probably look much like they do today. But they are likely to be more eco-friendly, with recycled building materials and greater use of wind and solar power. A pioneering building on Tyneside is showing the way for industrial and residential constructions of the future. The Groundwork Centre in Heaven is powered entirely by its own wind turbine and solar panels. Inside, surplus metro rails support the roof, it's heated by underground water and sewage is treated on site. The building's designers are convinced the energy saving techniques used in the centre will have to be adopted by builders in the next century, as homebuyers become more conscious of the cost of running an inefficient house. It's certainly possible to um, construct housing which uh, operates at virtually no cost. Um, we are only now getting the full benefit from heavy insulation, better glazing systems, um, glazing systems that allow heat in um, but don't allow heat out, um, and utilising the, the heat sources that are already within in the building. Um, Yes, we, for some reason we always look at the capital cost of building a house. What isn't taken into consideration uh, is the, the running cost of the house. It's funny, we, we've started to do that with motor cars. Now the MPG is important. If that philosophy was um, put into the, the housing market, yes, things would, things would be dramatically different. In things to come, houses are shown with acres of polished floors and transparent furniture. But one prediction the film makes, which has almost come true, is the flat screen TV. While it's still not possible to make them quite this thin, a North Tyneside company is making widescreen TVs just a few inches thick. Well, the main advantage is it's a brighter display, brighter picture. Uh, it's flat, perfectly flat. It's never out of focus. It's not scanned, which means you don't get the flickering that you normally get with a TV line generated screen. And um, of course, it's very thin and can be positioned against a wall or hung from a wall even. You're watching Northeast tonight. It's July the 16th, 2020. And here's Bob Johnson with the weather forecast. And I must say, Bob, you're looking younger than ever. Hey. But it's comforting to know some things will never change. Oh, right. yes. Yeah, I thought you said yes. you're looking younger than ever. You're right. <laughs> At Teesside University, a team of scientists is working on the control systems that will allow us to operate multiple flat screens in our homes of the future. Here we have a CD player. You could uh, select it from your screen here and drag it across to the middle screen, which is where it becomes active. Um, this object is a lot larger on the screen, which means you can interact with this object. So on your remote control, you would touch a CD and it starts playing. To move to the next track, you could run your finger across and flip to the next track. And likewise, go back to the previous track. Once you've finished with the CD, you could just drag it off your screen and it explodes and falls away into the distance to show that you've ejected it and it's no longer active. Then you might perhaps want to watch a movie, so you'd select your film spool from the side window, drag it to the middle and it becomes active, um, and this film spool spins around to show that you're actually watching the movie and then it comes on the screen there. And when you're finished, you could either drag the movie back or once it's finished playing, it goes back of its own accord and rests back on the left window. What we're trying to do in our research is to bring 
that kind of uh, feeling of comfort and understanding uh, back into products so that uh, people aren't intimidated by technology. In the past, um, we've always had uh, products which have a great deal of, of tactile feedback, um, you know, levers and uh, buttons and things which uh, have mechanical links, which is really nice because then you get all this kind of feedback as to what's actually happening. We, we could see what a product actually is changed quite significantly. If we take the example of a heating controller, for example, uh, what might happen is that might be connected to some computer somewhere and someone could offer you the service. They could say, well, we can reduce your, your heating bills by 20% uh, purely by knowing what the weather's going to be like the next day. So they could control your radiators and your boiler and that could uh, hold true for a whole range of, of products that you might have in the home. Um, I think what might happen from there on is that uh, products might start to become virtual in that we won't actually have the real uh, product in the home. I mean the telephone is a little bit like that at the moment. There's all sorts of features on a telephone which don't actually sit inside the telephone itself. They sit in a computer somewhere else. Virtual products existing in virtual reality. It's a new vocabulary for the new millennium. VR is a concept that's hard to get to grips with, but it's one that will dominate the next 20 years as scientists and artists collaborate to create a new universe in cyberspace. Teesside University is at the forefront of VR technology in the region. Here they have recreated the city centre of Middlesbrough, complete with shops, people and even traffic. Like the first moving pictures a hundred years ago, VR cinema is sometimes less than convincing, but its potential is clear. Once sound, smell and touch is added, it will be a total immersion experience, almost indistinguishable from reality, something film has never achieved. I think the total immersion experience is really on its way. I think we're very close to it here. We are, if we sit right in the hot spot in here, we feel as if we are there. Perhaps visually, if you really stop and think about it, it's not quite there. The shadows aren't there, some of the reflections aren't there. But as we move on, even in the next two years, we're going to have scenarios where the virtual world is as good as the real world for many, many purposes. Virtual set design, stage sets, virtual scenes, climbing mountains, uh, going rowing, the activities we might not be able to do uh, because we can't get to that special place. The things we dreamt we could do, and as we get older, that we might like to try and do, but it would be too dangerous to try. It will be virtual, but actually you'll think it's real. The Teesside University team have also been experimenting with VR headsets that allow the viewer to look around the virtual world in any direction and polarised glasses that can turn an ordinary computer screen into a 3D world that you can fly through and examine from any angle. This is a planned redevelopment of the Princess Mary Hospital in Newcastle by Yule Holmes. Customers can take a tour of the interior of any of the apartments, even though they are not yet completed. They can even see what wall colours go best with their furniture. In the future, homes will be built to order. Virtual reality can also take you into space, but while most of us would be content to view the Earth from orbit with a VR headset, thousands are queuing up to actually blast off and see it for real. Ingrid Kennedy of North Tyneside is one of them. A keen amateur astronomer, she's paid a deposit for a night in a hotel on the moon in 2017. She's been told it could cost as much as £40,000 for the trip, but she's determined to be among the first. I've always found it interesting that uh, there's billions of stars out there and that we're just like one you know, minuscule part of it. I just think it would be brilliant. The, uh, the view would be to die for. <laughs> um, the zero gravity, that would be an experience and I'll be only one of 10,000 people, so it's very limited. So at least I can see I've done it. Would-be space tourists can already get a taste of the view from the window of their orbiting hotel by visiting NASA's website on the internet, where live TV pictures are beamed from the space shuttle during missions. Groups of school children can even get the chance to operate the camera themselves. 
For this class of senior students at Predo in Northumberland, the countdown can't come fast enough. What information do we need after that? experience of going up in space, learning about things, looking down at the earth from up, up, up there, just be something that anyone my age would just dream about. I think I'd love to be able to see what the earth looked like from up in orbit, like on the moon or something. I think everybody's got their dreams and aspirations about space and what it'd be like living in space. And it's not just school children who are dreaming of leaving the Earth by 2020. In recent years, the Northeast has seen some ambitious attempts by amateur enthusiasts to get a private rocket into space. Among them is Tyneside's Derek Willis. Technologically, it's certainly possible, but on the grounds of cost, I just don't see it as being viable. Now, uh, for example, uh, the hotel would have to weigh around a, a thousand tonne to be able to get enough people in there. I've roughly calculated that the, the project would cost something like £50 billion pounds to do. If you built a shuttle which could carry 200 passengers at £40,000 per passenger, you'd have to launch three shuttles every day just to cover the, the interest charges. If private space travel does become a reality by 2020, it may be that only the wealthiest will be able to afford it. But as this Russian cosmonaut recently demonstrated, the idea of holidays in space is one that just won't go away. In the past 20 years, the industrial landscape of the Northeast has changed almost beyond recognition. Mining, shipbuilding, steel, all the old certainties have been swept away. The question now is, what will work be like in the future? People like Dave Mitchell are showing the way. He's the office worker of the future. Dave's an account manager with British Telecom, but he's seldom seen in his office. His base is his home in Sunderland. He keeps in touch with his boss and secretary using the latest in computerised gadgets. First thing I do in the morning, plug in the laptop, I use the mobile phone. That enables me to get my emails down. I can then, using the infrared link between my palm top and my laptop, make sure that my diaries are synchronised with that of my secretaries, and then I'm off for a day's work. Dave's job takes him all over the region to meetings with clients and potential customers. It's vital he stays constantly in touch. Hi, John. Hi, Dave. I'm just phoning to confirm that I'll be on the video conference, mate. No problem at all. I'll give you a bell as we agree. OK, see you then, Dave. Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye. Even while driving, Dave can collect voicemail through his mobile phone. And when there are faxes or emails to be attended to, he can pull into any lay-by and download them to his laptop computer. Our statistics show that there's about 2 million people now working in a non-conventional office environment. Uh, we alone in BT have about 2,000 people um, working either teleworking from home or, like myself, uh, professional nomadic people, for want of a better description. And I think as the technology improves and, and also the general way that companies do business um, goes on, then, yeah, I think it will increase. And I think it will become more and more acceptable for different professions to do it. I think that, that'll be the big change. For people born before 1960, this massive change in the way we work can be confusing and threatening. But the new job patterns are already in place in many industries and seem set to spread. On average in Britain, executives spend over 300 hours a year travelling to and from work. That's equivalent to over seven working weeks lost. Teleworking could replace the daily commute to the office or factory. But are people in the Northeast prepared to meet the challenge of change? Among those who believe they are is the former Joint Chief Executive of Swan Hunter, Roger Vaughan. We've seen the demise of 
coal mining, of shipbuilding, and to a lesser extent of engineering. And we've seen the, the great industries in the Northeast, which sustained its and its economy for, for many years, change radically. And that's brought a lot of pain for a lot of people, and they've seen the, the, the nature of the work that they've had to do change quite significantly. And, and is an indication of the sort of turmoil which is out there in the world economy. I think what's really important, though, is the way that the region has responded, particularly in the way that it's generated opportunities for new industries to grow. And I think that the inherent flexibility of the North East has brought it through what has been a very trying time. It's not brought it through for everybody, but I think for, for most people now, they can see the future with rather more optimism. The case for optimism is founded on a range of new industries which have come to the region. Efficient, high-tech factories turning out state-of-the-art products. Service industries like call centres, unheard of 20 years ago, now employ hundreds of local people. A reborn tourism industry employs thousands more. On the Tyne, the Weir and the Tees, former shipyard workers are turning their hands to the fabrication of highly specialised oil and gas modules. But the restructuring has been paid for with high levels of unemployment. And even for those lucky enough to find work, the future's still far from clear. Short-term and part-time contracts dominate the new industrial landscape. The old idea of the job for life may well have gone. And we may have to replace the idea of security with the idea of employability. What we need are the skills to make us employable in our next job, not just the one that we're in at the moment. Now, I think three people have a role to play in this. I think individuals themselves have got to be much better at thinking about how they're going to manage their own careers. I think employers have a role as part of the contracts that, if they're going to employ people on relatively short-term contracts, they've got to think about what those individuals are going to do afterwards. And I think thirdly, of course, the trade unions are having to reinvent themselves and think about their roles. And they have quite a difficult task because they're now going to have to represent people who are in part-time work, in, in multiple jobs, um, in multiple companies, and so that the structure of trade unions is likely to have to respond too. They may become more like professional associations, providing services to their members rather than simply representing them in, in wage negotiations. And we see these changes happening already. Once a week, Dave Mitchell visits his office in Newcastle for a meeting with his boss, who's based in London. He uses a video phone, which sends pictures down the phone line, along with his voice. Afternoon, John. Good afternoon, Dave. How are you today? All right? Fine, thank you. Just, just a couple of things I really think we need to cover through today. Um, if we can cover off the situation with the, the Walson bid, um, and also yeah. about Northern Informatics. Good. Fine, I've got one thing for you, so I'll, after you, old chap. There's a number of reasons why individuals and, and companies take to video conferencing. Um, let me talk from my own experience. What, what it gives me is the ability to have a meeting that normally wouldn't happen uh, because of people's diaries. Uh, I can set up a video link, as we've just seen, for 15, 20 minutes uh, with somebody who's got a very heavy diary. Uh, they don't have to travel. I don't have to travel. Uh, we can choose what time of day or night that we do it. So, so I think the great benefit is about being able to have meetings that normally wouldn't happen. And you get all the things about speed of response in there. There are obvious cost savings that attract other companies to it, especially where we're talking international travel. Um, you know, it really can cut down the expense uh, of, of closing a deal. Down at Martlesham Heath in Suffolk, Dave's colleagues at BT's Future Products Division are creating the next generation of gadgets for the teleworkers of the future. This is called the Smart Space. It's a compact communications and workstation featuring a wraparound screen and 3D sound. Images from television or computers can be projected in front of the viewer. Teleworkers can talk with colleagues, share computer files and send pictures. BT predicts that something like the smart space will become commonplace in homes by the year 2020. One, two, three. BT is also working on a computer-generated on-screen operator. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance. The mouth and eye movements are recorded from an actor's face, 
using a system called Gaze Tracker. The computer then adds a synthesized voice. Don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. Back on the road, Dave's downloading more email. He's always on call, an aspect of teleworking that some see as its major drawback. I don't actually see the being constantly contactable as a problem. I don't think my wife always sees it like that. Um, but for me, it gives me an opportunity to nip things in the bud before they become problems. And as I say, you just have to take it as a swings and roundabouts. If you do find yourself having to give up weekends or, or late nights, then it's a, case of, it's a case of putting that balance back into your life when maybe you're not so busy. And that, that's an important thing to do. The number of teleworkers in Britain is rising every year and it's expected to be a common work option by 2020. But some companies are already finding that it comes at a price. TNL is a computer company based at Hexham in the Tyne Valley. They started life as a group of teleworkers scattered across the northeast, but decided after a while to move back into a conventional office environment. They found that video conferencing and instant email was not the same as face-to-face -face interaction. One of the main reasons was that when you communicate electronically or just over the telephone, it doesn't give you the full benefits that you need with interactions with people, with customers, with work colleagues to explain situations. So we moved away from a teleworking only approach um, just because it wasn't satisfying all those requirements for people to fully communicate. It's got its place and we still, as I say, we still use it, but it's, it's more difficult to use that just by itself. Even five years ago, discussions about getting the right mix between real and virtual working environments in business would have been the stuff of science fiction. Compared with the Industrial Revolution, the coming of the Information Age has happened practically overnight. Computer halls like this one at Sunderland are symbolic of the new order. It's the centrepiece of the new campus at St Peter's, a tangible sign that, for these students at least, the future has already begun. We see them everywhere, of course, every home. Already they're on every workstation and office desk in most uh, large enterprises. So they simply will be the means by which we will we will trade, we will do commerce, we will communicate, we will vote, we will interact uh, civically with, uh, with our local government and our national governments. Um, there simply will be the, 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 the basis upon which we will conduct most of our lives. That seems to me very clear. I think we see now kids who are used to networking through using these machines. They're used to interacting with each other and also with artificial agents of various sorts. They're used to interacting with virtual environments and virtual people. That isn't going to go away. They have these experiences. Let's hope that they can work out a way in which they can be controlled and made good for the rest of humanity. Our children are getting a head start in the information age as computers have rapidly moved from being an expensive novelty in schools to being indispensable teaching tools. Experiments with computer-aided lessons have yielded remarkable results. Youngsters seem to take to the technology immediately. While most people over 30 have difficulty learning how to use computers, this generation has known nothing else. For them, a future with teleworking and robot teachers holds no fears. Well, I think we might stay at home and work because, like, you can get private tutors now and, like, the computer could be one of them. We'll probably still have teachers, but, diff like, different sorts of teachers. Or, and there might be computers that you can, like, tell you what you do. If you had a robot, um, robot teacher, you could deactivate it. So I'd like having a robot. Yeah. Coming up in part two, schools in cyberspace for the young. Will parents surf the net too? And going to work in the office of the future. For the meal we ought to prepare. Education is already changing as a result of the introduction of computers. A recent study by the Henley Centre for Barclays Life predicts that by 2020, one in five of all British children will be going to school in cyberspace. In the long term, the internet 
offers a radical change. It really offers the potential to have best practice teaching available to all children at all times. People can go to the internet for courses, for teaching online, for following programs and schedules uh, of learning and it really offers, offers a radical change. It also means that people could be taught from home and so in the future it may well be that we see more and more parents not necessarily taking their children out of school because it may well be that you may get almost the school coming into the home. One can envisage situations where maybe you have a dozen or more children with their friends being taught at home through the internet. Um, still go to school, but there's such potential there that really radical changes can, might well occur as well. And will the, how will the government respond to this? Well, the simple answer is that there are real, real incentives for the government to encourage it to occur because the cost of tu tuition per pupil now runs into the thousands. But teaching people online could save a lot of money. Children are not the only ones who will benefit from lessons in cyberspace. Teachers, too, will be freed from the need to be physically present in a class. Using televideo, a teacher could hold a class with children who may be scattered across the country or across the globe. Morning, Judy. Morning, Lee. And morning, Bradley. By 2020, the growth of the Internet as a source of information will have developed to the point where all the world's most important books, films, videos, still pictures and music will be instantly available. Virtual copies of precious manuscripts like the Lindisfarne Gospels will be shared by a global audience. But while the emphasis on children's education is understandable, new ways of bringing the future to adults are just as important. This is especially true in the country, which is why, earlier this year, Northumberland College began touring remote areas with a specially converted bus designed to bring computer training to those who might otherwise miss out. The University of Newcastle recently studied the impact of what they call telematics on the rural economy. Well, certainly it has potential um, to help the, the businesses in the region and employment in the rural region. Um, but if that's really to be realised, there's a number of constraints that have to be overcome. Um, the first main one is actually getting the people who already work or live in rural areas um, with a greater awareness of the benefits of telematics, uh, training in how to use the technology and so on and that needs to be delivered locally um, which obviously in remoter areas is difficult um, and secondly there's problems with the telecommunications infrastructure uh, in that it's not developing as fast the more advanced telecommunications is not coming on, on stream in rural areas as quickly as it is in urban areas. Cyber commerce promises rural businesses an extra edge they've never enjoyed before Already, many of Britain's leading companies have set up internet sites. Using secret codes, it's possible to transfer money and send private email securely. All the indications are that business on the internet is set to boom. One can envisage a situation where some of the largest companies in the FTSE 100 index, for example, may actually be virtual in many senses. That's not to say that they won't have a corporate headquarters, it's just that it will be very, very small, minuscule, compared with the existing structures for large companies. The leap from the traditional office to a virtual headquarters is unlikely to take place overnight. But as more businesses trade globally through the internet, and as more employees telework from home, there may be less need for corporate buildings. By 2020, the workplace itself may also have changed dramatically. For the moment, this is the state of the art in office design. Arthur Andersons is a firm of consultants with branches worldwide. One floor of their London office has been converted into a living laboratory where theories about improving efficiency by improving design are tried out in the real world. Gone is the intimidating boardroom, replaced here by intimate conversation areas. The open plan design is divided into spaces with different functions, where teams of workers or individuals can come and go as they please. There's a chaos area where ideas can be brainstormed by groups working on a particular project. 
There's a zen area for quiet thought, where mobile phones and conversations are banned. And there's a touchdown zone, looking just like a busy cafe counter, with big windows facing out onto the street. Nobody has their own desk. Lockers provide central storage for personal effects, and workers drift from one area to another, plugging in their computers wherever they wish. It's designed to be more efficient, but also pleasant to work in. It's really about treating people as humans first and workers or consultants second. So when you're thinking about humans holistically, you look at um, changing their kind of perspectives, having stimulating things, what kinds of fabrics, colors, and all those things kind of impact us, albeit subtly, on the kinds of experiences we're going to have in this place. And over 75% of the people here think it's a significant improvement over what we've had or what indeed other, other workers have to deal with in their offices. The workplace of the future might also encourage employers to take a more wide-ranging responsibility for their workers' well-being. I think of this as kind of a, a broad canvas that we're still painting and we're still completing. So I think there's large scope for us to continue to go forward. Um, two of the things we're going to introduce are community programs for help um, taking care of the learning needs and the kind of stimulus for people when they are here. So we'll bring in things like um, mental or intellectual aerobics. We'll bring in fresh whole foods um, to serve in the cafe, green teas as opposed to things with caffeine. So we'll invite people to try some things that might actually have a positive impact on their energy enthusiasm while they're here. By 2020, large numbers of workers will be on short-term or casual contracts. We'll probably have to carry an identity chip. Employers will be able to instantly confirm who you are, your qualifications, your references. It will be your passport, driving license and credit card. It can even store your medical records. Credit card fraud costs the banks millions of pounds every year. With so much sensitive information and the whole of your banking records on one chip, strong measures will be needed to prevent fraud. That may mean your employer and the government will have to know more about you than ever before. Fingerprints never change throughout your life. The shape of your hand can identify you. The interior of the eye is also unique to each individual. This cash machine scans the eyes of the customer and compares the pattern of their iris with those on its data bank. The system does away with the need for PIN numbers. Future employers might also check a digital map of your face. Security cameras are now a common feature of most town centres. A computer can be programmed to look for an individual in a crowd and monitor their movements. On the road, cameras will be able to check every number plate as it passes. It's a far cry from the world of work in which most of us grew up. When the traditional industries of the Northeast were still at their height, the vision of a future where our daily movements could be traced and recorded in detail would have seemed like a nightmare. But the past is already beyond reach. Whatever the future holds, it's likely that the working world of 2020 will differ fundamentally in structure from today. It's clear that the new economy will be built on information, not coal and steel. The growth of global business will set the new agenda. Businesses trading in cyberspace, big enough and powerful enough to demand restructuring of the world's economy. As the dust settles on the ruins of the Industrial Revolution, we are about to enter a period which will transform the way we work and trade. Possibly the greatest transformation of all could be a grassroots pressure for a one-world currency. This sounds very wild. We're not saying there will be a one-world currency by 2020. There are enough problems trying to introduce a single currency in Europe uh, up until the year 2000. But there will be changes there. There will be, and as more as more people begin to operate globally and trade online, then they're going to begin to start saying the same things that companies say. We want to reduce our exposure to currency fluctuation. We want some certainty in our planning here. 
And you can envisage individuals saying the same thing if they're trying to buy things online for mail order overseas or whatever. They begin to think a little bit more like businesses and as a result they may well be calling for introduction of currency stability and moves towards a one world currency. Not going to happen in 10 years time, not going to be introduced in 20 years time. But the fact that we'll be talking about the possibility even of it being introduced in 10 or 20 years time is a radical change of itself. The end of the world or the dawn of a greener planet? What's our environmental future? Everyone wants to know, but here's what they most want to know. What on earth is happening to our weather? Some say the world will end in ice, some say in fire. At Sunderland, they've been watching the weather since records began. Climate experts used to worry about the next ice age. Today, they say things are hotting up. The argument is quite a straightforward one, and that is that the more carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere as a result of the burning of fossil fuels, the greater will be the degree of warming as a result of the increased concentration of those greenhouse gases. But if we look to the future, the next 10, 20 or 30 years, we certainly should anticipate the temperature increases that we've seen in the past decade to continue. Here in the northeast, what we could expect is certainly warmer winters, and if we look back over the past 10 years, we've seen strong evidence of that already. In addition to that, of course, that there will be changes in the rainfall regime, and, and there's a strong probability that the rainfall, in fact, will begin to decrease in the region over the next 10 or 20 years, and it does mean that the northeast of England could be rather sunnier than it is at the moment. Better weather, good news, not necessarily for farming. The world's grain baskets could turn to dust, though closer to home we might grow a more colourful range of crops. Water conservation will be a big issue as demand goes up while the rain dries up, but we may think it's worth it for more sunshine. Another problem could be much more erratic day-to-day -day weather, but it's hard to tell. The picture's still too complicated to give us a clear answer. I don't really know, but I just think it'll be much hotter because it's been getting hotter like most years. By then, you never know, the ozone layer might have burnt up and all the proto ice caps might have melted, so it'll help you. Dangerous. Intriguingly, astronomers believe the sun itself could hold the key to climate change. Sunspots are magnetic patches on the sun's surface, which signal that violent activity is coming. Then, outbursts of electrically charged particles bombard the Earth's atmosphere and affect weather patterns. When there have been more sunspots, the Earth has got warmer. And right now, more sunspots are appearing. So is global warming nothing to do with our fossil fuel emissions? Some astronomers say it could be a mixture of what we do and what the sun does. There's a strong suspicion that we are producing an increase in the surface temperature of the Earth. But also, we think that the increased activity of the sun may also be responsible for an increase in the temperature of the Earth. And we can't quite untangle the two effects. Whatever the answer, this solar electricity does mean we'll have ringside seats for the northern lights. A lot of light's been shed on airborne pollution. We all cause it when we drive our cars, but in industrial towns, air quality is improving as industry is made to clean up. Our rivers are getting cleaner too, but the spotlight remains on chemical companies which still dump in rivers like the Tees. The industry says things will continue to improve, but how much? We will have got, within the next couple of years, to a situation where the river is living again. It will have fish in it. It will be uh, essentially sort of 95 percent of the re uh, reduction of the chemical effluent. Now the remaining five percent would be very very expensive to remove and I think like in a lot of questions relating to uh, the environment it's a question of balance. But within that leftover five percent are small amounts of new powerful substances like so-called gender benders blamed for causing sex changes in fish. 
These days there are more pervasive chemicals, and chemicals that we know very little about, that are being discharged quite freely into rivers like the Tees. And uh, really, we have to look at the future for the chemical industry and learn how to use chemicals sustainably and not to pollute the rivers and ultimately the wildlife population and, and human population as well. We may have to view industry differently in future if companies do clean up radically. Pollution laws will get tougher and many firms are investing heavily in clean technology. So who or what will we blame for local pollution? There is a tendency within society uh, to want to blame somebody and the chemical industry for good reason has been a body that's been worthy of blame. However, it has got its act together and I think society will be looking for other targets. Those targets could be antisocial issues spoiling our local environments, like litter, graffiti and noise. Noise pollution is growing and it'll be less acceptable, so we might hear an end to noisy neighbours and the local pub karaoke. But the way things are going, other noise may be drowned out in the growing roar of traffic. We're heading for gridlock, and we've seen it coming for decades. Quite frankly, I don't think our present system of transportation, congested roads, congested ports, seaways, aircraft, I don't think it can take this expansion. No surprise there, but today's visions of future transport are not what you might expect. Predicting trends is the job of the Henley Centre for Forecasting, and here's what they envisaged in a recent report for Barclays Life. We think there'll be a rail renaissance involving much faster trains, magnetic levitation trains, already developed, already seen them introduced and tested, Germany, Japan, and so the technology is there. Successors of this prototype could glide at hundreds of miles an hour on magnetic rails with no friction to slow things down. Commuter journeys could take seconds, not minutes, and after that... One can envisage a, one, a future space shuttle which takes you out of the Earth's atmosphere and brings you back in and means that you can cross the globe in a matter of a couple of hours, possibly. And so, for the wealthiest in the future, the very wealthiest, it may mean that you could lit literally commute to San Francisco or commute to Sydney. Um, these are not beyond the realms of possibility. Uh, now, now they seem completely unreal and bizarre. But a decade from now, two decades from now, well, I wouldn't be so sure. There'll be, um, like, cars are powered by oxygen and the oxygen comes out. And the, the cars can fly over, cars to take over, or blow up them with missiles. Back to reality, and it looks like the future will be one long traffic jam. Car numbers in Britain go up by 10,000 a week, and there could be up to 33 million cars by 2020. Local authorities are using car bans and parking charges to get people back on the train and the bus. We have to get a balance. We have to be able to accommodate cars in the city centre, car parking in the city centre, where there is a need to use a car, but we have to find subtle and gentle ways of making transit systems more appealing to people so they, they, they do use those transit systems. The government's trying to give priority to public transport and it hopes to raise the money for new transport systems through pay-as-you-drive schemes and parking taxes. Then people will switch to trams, buses, bikes and trains and passenger transport will finally be in the fast lane. That's the theory, but transport experts think drivers may revolt, making the government back down. You may well get um, a reaction by people to the idea that they should use their cars less, and they'll vote with their wheels. So that despite putting more effort into public transport and exhorting people to walk and to cycle, they will continue to use their cars. Professor Hill's suggestions start with scrapping the car tax disc. If we could shift this away from fixed taxes towards a more pay-as-you-go system, then that would be fairer for, for example, people living in rural areas who would end up paying less. Uh, that would be offset, of course, by people in congested urban areas paying a great deal more. And if this means fewer leisure trips, well, then that's a price that we'll have to pay. The charging could be done with new smart car technology involving an onboard computer in your car and a system of sensors on the road. The technology there will mean that people can be 
checked and recorded when they're making journeys and so and you'll just be invoiced with your monthly account just as you are with your credit card at the moment and so the technology there will permit increased road privatization and so obviously that provides some disincentives for people to, to use the car so there will be some switches towards other forms of transport as well. Even so, our roads will still be crowded, but technology may offer a solution. In future, your car computer could be in the driving seat. One can see the technology already in play to regulate distances between cars, so one can envisage a situation in the future whereby you literally sit back and drive along um, with your speed and the distance between yourself and another car regulated um, by technology. Uh, so safe road safety should increase in the longer term as well. Coming up in part two, genetically engineered food, plus the new science which just might solve the energy crisis. Well, we've just about gone into the space age, I think. We've got steaks that uh, never saw a beef animal at all. Now, you see this chip thing here? Yeah. yeah. These chips are made out of potato. Isn't that marvellous? But in nutritional terms, I can see no objection to this kind of product. We've been doing unnatural things to our food for years. According to Dr. Gao, we'll soon be asking for bacteria and two veg. But is genetic engineering taking things too far? There's mounting concern about genetically modified or GM foods. There is a public outcry against GM crops at the moment. A recent Mori poll showed that 77% of people are definite that they want a ban on GM crops in this country. The fuss is about mixing living particles between different types of plants to protect crops against pests and disease and let weed killers and pesticides work better. You can also get vegetables that don't go off too fast. In Britain, there are already 300 genetic crop testing sites. What happens if the pollen gets mixed up with normal plants? The worst case scenario would be severe genetic pollution of other crops and wild plants. We could be looking at super weeds running rampant across the countryside um, where herbicides would become completely ineffective on them. Um, we'd be looking at, at uh, wiping out wildlife in the countryside um, and creating a, a barren landscape where only these super genetically modified crops can grow. Biotechnologists say they'll find ways round this, perhaps by creating plants with no pollen. Meanwhile, Europe is bringing in more safeguards. Spearheading that move is one of the region's Euro MPs. We need a better and wider risk assessment that really does take serious account of possible long-term effects on human health or the natural environment. Um, that can be done, and I think in the new legislation it will be done. That really will stop, I think, um, some of uh, people's fears about the, the spreading of these things into the natural environment being realised. Fears or no fears, shoppers have been snapping up cut-price tomato puree made from GM vegetables and food labelling offers consumer choice. Is it safe to eat? The experts say yes, as far as we know. We may even get superfoods with added health benefits. For instance, human antibodies, which fight disease, could be added to apple trees. An apple a day really would keep the doctor away. That controversy is still to come, but right now, engineers and botanists are working on how to make industrial-type processes happen inside plants. Imagine, for example, if you could produce diesel fuel for buses in crops, or you could produce biodegradable plastics, or you could produce fast dry, dry, drying oils for paints in field crops. Well, these are things that are actually already possible. And if you could produce these without using fossil fuels, which is the source of these commodities at the moment, it could be environmentally extremely beneficial. These plants won't just be sitting there looking colorful, there will be powerhouses using sunlight and water to trigger internal chemical reactions, making products we can extract. But there's something no one is planning for. Once plants can be engineered to do anything, anywhere, what happens to world agricultural markets? If you can drastically modify crop plants, so for example we could get oilseed rape plants that would make palm oil, we wouldn't need to import palm oil from Malaysia and that might have an enormous effect on their economy. And that kind of thing, those kinds of long-term, large-scale effects could disrupt uh, the, the pattern of, of trade throughout the world. It's got enormous implications. Whatever happens, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. Big business sees an opportunity to feed the world at a price. Engineered foods, and maybe animals too, will be part of our future, if the public will stand for it. 
Well, I think in 20 years' time, the biotechnology industry and its products will be a lot more accepted than they are now. In many ways, you won't see them or realise they're there unless, of course, they're pharmaceuticals or food and people are taking them into their bodies, in which case they will have to be labelled and will, people will have a choice. There won't be any farmers because they'll be made up food. There'll just be lots of animals, so animals can live and it might be like human beings and invent things. Well, maybe one day. Certainly this century, farming's gone through massive changes. From now on, it may take fewer farmers to feed the world, as science reduces the chance of crop failure. There will be a large number of farmers who become part-time farmers, that they will be earning the majority of their money from off the farm. It already happens in other parts of Europe, and I think we'll start to see that happening here in England. As predicted years ago, some may even go to work in the new biotechnology industry. And these are the farm workers of the future. Subsidies will go, but instead farmers will be given grants to look after the landscape and produce organic and speciality foods. And the public will probably be willing to pay for a partial return to traditional ways. Farmers have been criticised for denuding the landscape and uh, there's been a lot of emotive headlines about hedges being pulled out. I think that during the last 10 years, we've seen a more neutral type of farming being developed. And I think what we'll see in the future is that things will begin to go full circle. There's an urban renaissance too. Single people and childless couples are opting for city centre living, and the urban environment will have much more than just shops and offices. But the countryside's still being eaten up. There's a need for more homes. They have to go somewhere, and though most people say they care about the green belt, it doesn't stop them wanting to move there. We need to make towns more attractive, so people will want to live in them. Otherwise, the countryside will carry on shrinking. I think our worst fears would be uh, more of the same, really. I think more development in the countryside, that sort of inappropriate development, more pressure on green belts, which will obviously lead to further decline of urban areas making quality of life worse for people in urban areas and in the countryside. But there are good reasons why those fears might come true, and it comes down to money. In towns and cities, there's a tax on redevelopment, but in the country, it's a different picture. Greenfield developments are tax-free, and the more green land you're allowed to build on, the cheaper it becomes. Lower land prices mean affordable homes for families. Economic forecasters see it happening. The city will be big news in the future, and but at the same time, people are going to move out from suburbia, and suburbia will extend uh, into greater hinterland. We actually think over the longer term, there is going to be immense pressure to build on Greenbelt, and really, two decades from now, we can't actually be sure the Greenbelt policy will even be in existence. This sounds extreme, but we actually think it's, it's, it's a, a very strong possibility. All the more important, then, to make urban areas greener. Middlesbrough is one of the UK's environment cities, testbeds of good practice. There's a very clear vision of how they'd like the borough to look. Here we are in the year 2020, and uh, Middlesbrough's quite a pleasant place, isn't it? If we run, wander around the town centre, you'll see there isn't much traffic. What traffic there is is, is very clean and unpolluting. Um, most people use the public transport, the buses and the trams, or they use the electric taxis to drive around the town in. It's a much greener place than it used to be as well. You notice the amount of greenery, the number of trees around, and if we go to the edge of town, then we're in the middle of the Cleveland Community Forest, which was begun during the, during the 1990s and has now become immature. So quite a pleasant place to be in. In this vision, the Transporter Bridge is the hub of a revived waterfront where you can watch seals and otters in the Tees. One of the town's biggest employers is the waste recycling business. We're back in the 1990s, and that was just our vision of the future. It was a very attractive vision. It's a bit ambitious, perhaps, to achieve it by 2020, but it is something we can focus on and work towards. Local people have joined in, and one forward-looking group call themselves Acklam 2020. They're protecting woodlands and recycling everything they can. I know some people say, you know, we're only fiddling about doing little bits around the edges, but I think we can make a big difference in we can think global and act local, and I think that really will make a difference. If we all do a little bit, and we would all help the environment then. We've got to help each other, we've got to care for each other and the environment. Something we could all do is save energy and turn out the lights. 
A quarter of carbon dioxide emissions come from our homes, but people are slow to get the energy efficiency message, according to those promoting it. It's very easy for people to sit down and do nothing, and if we sit down and do nothing, our houses will remain fairly inefficient and it will be catastrophic for the environment. In future, house sellers may have to give potential buyers their home energy rating, along with other information contained in the normal house survey. That might even lead us to invest in solar panels and our own backyard wind turbines. Today, wind power is the only economically viable source of renewable energy, but it can be controversial. We'd like to see the wind power being generated in places where the community wants it as well and uh, to create opportunities for offshore wind power and, uh, and inshore, but where it's suitable. But solar power is still awaiting a technological breakthrough. It works on an experimental scale, but collecting enough power for Britain's needs would mean covering the land with solar panels. The solution to the problem has so far eluded us. But now there's a new science offering tantalising possibilities. Nanotechnology, a way to break the bonds of nature. And it starts with giving the mighty atom a good shove. Three atoms together measure just one millionth of a millimetre. They exist in strong chemical bonds, but if that can be broken, atoms can be rearranged into new structures. Scientists believe they can eventually create millions of atom-sized machines powered by their own chemical and electrical reactions. Deep within Newcastle University, they're using powerful microscopes and electrical currents to push individual atoms into new patterns never before known. That is one of the most powerful aspects of nanotechnology. We don't, we're not relying anymore on nature, on what nature delivers us. Nature gives us the sunrise, but what if we could make atom-sized devices programmed to grab the sun's heat? Millions of tiny machines together could work like a power station. Made from the right compounds, they could even be painted onto roads. Small solar collecting devices could, for example, be used in the surfaces of roads to collect light and, and convert it into the solar energy. It does have possibilities, um, and the big advantage uh, of uh, that is that it's using, as a solar collector, an area of uh, the country which is already being used uh, for another purpose and so it does not result in any further destruction uh, of the environment. The applications will be limitless if we can rearrange atoms into these patterns. Tiny nanorobots could burrow into waste to pick out chemical elements for reuse. Minuscule sensors could alert us to pollution. New materials could give us ultralight aircraft using far less fuel, and much more. They'll be the midget gems of the science world. There's even talk of producing energy from thin air, grabbing carbon atoms to use for fuel, solving global warming and the energy crisis. Is there a downside? We'll have to wait and see. A record in the past of uh, forecasting what uh, would be possible in the future is not particularly good. I think that we have to assume that with such a powerful new methods of creating new materials, new devices, that the impact on all walks of life is likely to be enormous. Next week, after engineered plants, will it be engineered people? Your future health on 2020.